Thank you for mentioning the code of conduct. Um, I've always found uh, IRPIC meetings to be uh, quite friendly, but you know, as a white cis male, it's pretty easy for me to think that. Uh, the uh, but as IRPIC grows, there's going to be a greater group of people, a larger group of people, hopefully, and uh, a more diverse set of experiences. So, uh, having a good baseline for everyone is important. So, glad we're doing that. The, uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I am the co-lead of the Glaciers and Sea Level Collaboration Team uh, as part of our, like the IRPIC teams. And uh, my other co-lead, Caitlin Florentine, can't be here today. She's, um, she's out doing field work, so uh, we'd be glad to be here, but also jealous of her. And uh, she's with the USGS. And today uh, the, uh, we'll be discussing schools on ice, which is going to be fun. Uh, and we've got uh, two folk who lead uh, scientists who lead glacier, U.S. glacier schools. Uh, Regina Hawk, uh, who uh, is now at the University of Oslo, but also still is affiliated with University of Alaska Fairbanks, who leads the, the UFGI uh, summer school. And uh, Seth Campbell from the University of Maine, who uh, leads the Juno Ice Field Research Program. Um, and so we'll be hearing from both of them today. And uh, that's great. I'm, I'm not anticipating there are too many students in the audience, although it'd be great to see if they are. Uh, what I suspect is uh, that many of us have gray in our hair, maybe more than before, thanks to 2020. Uh, and we'll be uh, wanting to better understand what the state of these schools uh, is, what they try to do, uh, uh, how they've uh, gone through 2020 and what their plans for the future are. Uh, so that we can hopefully uh, encourage uh, the students that we encounter in our professional lives uh, to uh, consider attending these schools. So uh, that's, uh, that's the goal of the meeting. Uh, and because, you know, hopefully the, the more students we have, the better understand glaciers, uh, the better our and ice in general, uh, the better we can understand the Arctic more broadly. So uh, that's the plan. And uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the presentations. So uh, we're going to switch up the order from the agenda. Uh, we're going to have Ravina go first, just because uh, she has a tighter time constraint at the end. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Regina, uh, would, you, yeah. uh, can, would you like to go ahead and share your screen? Yes. Can you see? Uh, can you hear me and Not see? Yet. We, we oh, can okay. hear you, but we can't we can hear you. the presentation yeah. yet. Okay. Uh, what about now? No, you're going to have to click the share button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I... Oh, I see. There we go. Okay, so you can hear and see now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity here to speak about our uh, UF summer school. Um, the motivation for this uh, summer school is that, uh, as everybody knows, there are, I mean, glaciers and ice sheets are rapidly changing. There's major social environmental implications, and that requires um, international high level of expertise in glaciological issues. Mm -hmm. um, there is the other sort of motivation is there is to at least in our knowledge no undergraduate degree in glaciology anywhere and many many glaciology graduate programs don't even have any glaciology classes and then finally also glaciology graduate students they come from very very different backgrounds math physics and um, engineering geography um, and they often lack a basic glaciology background before they mm -hmm. enter the graduate program. I mean, we, many glaciology graduate students have never taken a, um, a glaciology class and what we have also seen, not, not even seen a glacier in their life. So the idea was adopted from the Carter Summer School in Europe, which was started by Hans Erlemanns uh, from Utrecht University. And also Kalein here, Jordan, who was on the talk, has been teaching and co-organizing it. This has been going on for more than 25 years, and it's just an absolutely wonderful thing. And in fact, like in uh, uh, Martin Truffer and I, we both of us attended the very, very first summer school in 1995. And it was just an amazing experience uh, for, for us 
And many on this photo here stayed in science. Many of us are still in contact with each other. And we were just inspired by this experience. And we thought we need something like that in North America when, when I moved to the US. And we also felt like we are a big group, a big biology group covering very, very broad different topics so that we can pull that off. And was another motivation was then also that the Carter School is um, pretty Europe focused in terms of the participant, at least the majority, and there's a lot more applications than slots. So um, the idea was just to fill that gap that there is a, a larger need internationally and especially in North America. Um, so we didn't invent anything new. We are really just adopting this idea that the University of Utrecht has started and which was just uh, wonderful. So the content is very similar, what we do like Cartos, but it varies naturally due to the very different set of instructors, but also the setting is very, very different. I mean, ours is really sort of a white risk, low budget version of the Carter School. So where is McCarthy? So, um, we start from Fairbanks here, uh, then we drive down here to McCarthy. It's a 12 hour drive, including many breaks. And the last two hours are dirt road. So it's really in the middle of nowhere, last two hours. I mean, you don't see any buildings, anything. You end up there in McCarthy. It's a wonderful drive here through the Alaska range. And we end up in this tiny, tiny little vi village of McCarthy, which in winter has about five inhabitants and in summer, maybe two, 300 or so. So why do we go there? Why don't we stay just in Fairbanks? Um, that's actually the appeal. It is remote and small, really tiny village. Um, off the grid, electricity comes from solar or generators. Um, we can use the facilities of the Wrangell Mountain Center that you see here on, on the right. And uh, Tim Bartholomeus, he's on the call here and he's uh, um, part of um, the board here. And they have been wonderful hosts and they provide us with the meals and the facilities and it's just a really in perfect environment. Um, it's close to, very close to a glacier. The, um, uh, the glacier actually almost essentially ends up in the village and it's right in the vicinity of about 5,000 square kilometers of ice, which is like twice the, the, uh, the, the area of uh, of the ice and our glaciers in Scandinavia or in, in, in the European Alps. So it's just really a wonderful and stunning scenery. So this environment really provides a very unique setting uh, for this experience for our summer school. And we think it's also especially this environment that helps with the networking among the students and um, the instructors because essentially nobody can escape. You're stuck in this village there's not much in terms of uh, distraction. Um, and also like uh, the requirement for the instructors is to be there the entire time. So they don't go home or, or have some meetings or something. You're really just at the, a little bit at the end of the world, remote from anything and uh, can really indulge in this, this uh, very, very intense experience. Um, yeah, just here a few more. Uh, uh, sort of impressions, the students camp with a, I mean, a fantastic view here onto the, the ice field. I mean, all the meals are taken together. So you really spend a lot of time like um, together and that is really part of it. It's also culturally a very interesting site here, a uh, place. There's this old copper mine from like a hundred years ago. Uh, where do the students come from so far? There have been about, we have done it five times, um, 140 students from 20 countries, far more nationalities actually. And the ge geographic diversity is one of the criteria for the student selection. And we really aim for a diverse group. group. And this diversity makes the course very special and is typically really highly appreciated by the students and the instructors. Um, what are our objectives? So there's essentially two. And one is, of course, to provide the students with an overview of the physics of glaciers, so teach them some glaciology. But also, and just, just, uh, just as important for us, is to promote collaboration um, by providing a platform for networking and um, yeah, promoting the exchange of ideas among the students and also with or, um, the, the senior scientists who are there, the instructors. Um, and how do we do this? It's an 11-day intense course. 
um, offered every second year. We started in 2010. This year, for obvious reasons, we had to cancel. And open to students around the world, we take 28 to 29, uh, 27 to 28 PhD students, sometimes also master students uh, per course. Half of them tend to come from the US. So it's just because where the funding comes from and half come from, from other countries. There's about six, seven to nine instructors. So typically five or so from UF, University of Alaska. And then we invite like two or three external instructors and they usually come from the US or Canada or sometimes even we had uh, instructors from Europe. We have a hundred applications every year, every time. So there's sort of a high chance not to get in. So it really tells you the demand for, for such a class. Um, we start, so what do we do? We always start with a poster session, also a very unique setting here with posters on laundry lines. And it's so that the students become familiar with each other's research. Then in the morning, we have lectures on all kinds of different topics uh, in glaciology in this beautiful little hut here. That's our lecture hall. And that was also the limitation why we can't take more students. And of course, also the other thing that sort of in COVID times, I mean, there's no way we could have done it this year. There's no way to spread out. I mean, we essentially fill this lecture hall to the limit. Um, then we, in the afternoon, we usually consolidate the material from the lectures and some exercises. Um, so for half the afternoon, and then um, all students work on a project in teams of two with an instructor. And uh, just to give an idea of the topics here. So the projects are then really a lot of programming, coding, calculating things with real data and really sort of tackling a small pro problem with a research question, with data, with analysis and discussion and, and so on. And this whole, I mean, this format, as I said, is essentially what also Cartos is doing, but because it was such a great idea, there was no idea, no need to change it. So we essentially adopted that, that format. The students then present at the end in a mini conference in sort of AGU uh, style talks, present the results of their talks. And we are, I mean, every time absolutely impressed what they can do in just a few days. I mean, many of the talks are actually better than many AGU talks. And, and some of these uh, uh, projects have advanced so far that with a little bit of more work afterwards, the students continue to work on it. And two of them were published in peer reviewed journals. So that was really sort of a success of the, that beyond, it wasn't even part of their thesis. Um, we also do excursions. We do one big one, which is, of course, a challenge when you have about almost 40 people on a really big glacier. And each time it's about 15 to 25 percent of the students who have never been on a glacier and a number have never seen one. And so that is, of course, I mean, very special experience then for them. And here, just some impressions, how it looks like. Uh, the glacier is uh, it's really stunning scenery. And it offers also a lot in terms of, you can really talk a lot, discuss a lot about glaciological processes and show a lot of the structures and surface type and hydrology, like this lake here is actually draining every year. And some years we were there was no lake. Last year, for the first time, there was actually a lake. So it's sort of a very, very interesting environment. The glacier itself is very interesting. Um, just sort of the impact, um, the students definitely increase the literacy in glaciology, so it have a broader foundation beyond the topic of their thesis. And what we, we think is very important, they create a personal and professional network with glaciologists around the world, and that of course opens opportunity for future collaboration. Um, and we think really that this remote and very isolated setting that definitely enhances the student learning. It facilitates this unique networking opportunity where none, neither the students nor the instructors can escape and take an evening off or so. And um, the course has received very high, uh, highly positive student evaluations and many students have kind of stayed in contact. Um, and I mean, we always have a very popular like annual reunion at AGU where like students even from like eight or 10 years ago are very happy to, to join. Um, there have been really direct collaborations between students and students or students and instructors that have evolved from the summer school. Many have moved on to academic positions over the years. 
and the course material and still use the course material that we uh, that we have developed and that is actually on the home page. Mm -hmm. And the high number of applications really indicates a high need for this class and to continue. And that brings me a little bit also to the challenges here. Um, the cost of the course is about forty-five to fifty thousand dollars, which in a way is a lot, but in another way it's not because it is for 28 students, an experience over 11 days, in a way this is nothing, but of course we need to find it. And that's the cost includes, um, I mean, all costs once the students are in, in Fairbanks. So the transport to McCarthy, meals, accommodation, airfare for the external instructors, all the instructors volunteer the time, I and mean, we not even getting per diem or anything. Um, the students have to pay, pay, uh, pay the airfare. I mean, they have to get to Fairbanks. Um, and usually we, not all the time, but we typically need to take a fee to make the budget work. And we try to keep it low because they have to pay the, the airfare. And when they come from South America or Nepal or New Zealand, this is of course a lot. So each year, so this is the main challenge. We have a hunt for funding from scratch. There's no continued funding. So writing proposals, approaching international organizations. And our main sponsors have been those organizations here. We're very, very happy that NASA has um, almost all summer schools provided a base funding about 20, uh, $25,000, um, which without that funding, we couldn't do it. And that essentially covers the American students, or American based students. And then we have to scramble, go to these international organizations, which also have extremely um, supportive, but for each of them, you have to write a proposal, a report, have to go through like always very different steps to, to receive from each of them between a thousand or two thousand or three thousand or four thousand dollars, and which then add up to the, the entire amount that we need. So, but we are I mean, very grateful to have that funding, but that is sort of one of the challenge. And of course, now this year, the challenge is that we had to postpone. Many students of course very disappointed that we couldn't do it. We want to do it now in June next year, but we are we don't know if we can do it. And there's in a way no other way. Um, doing it remotely is not um, the whole experience. Is really this networking and the entire setting and environment that has really sort of a transformational um, impact on many many students. So yeah, thank you very much. Here with another nice picture where the students actually were jumping into that lake after they first inspected it. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, Regina. Uh, that was that was great. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to say, I would not have expected that you were getting 100 applicants every year. That is astonishing and, uh, and, a, and a big indicator of the demand for this. Yeah. Um, uh, any questions for Reg Regina based on her uh, presentation? Looks like Ellen is trying to say something. Yes, I'm trying. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I was looking for if I could raise my hand. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, that this school is is so similar to the Carthouse Summer School, with the the very same ideas of getting to a remote place. I mean, Carthouse uh, or Carthouse is maybe not as remote as. Uh, McCarthy is, but it is also a place where it's a very small town. Nobody can go anywhere else. So it's it's all about this networking part besides uh, teaching them uh, glaciology. So I, I'm, I, I could have given this presentation more or less the same for the Carthouse Summer School. There's, there's not much difference between them. And also Carthouse receives 80, 90 uh, students applications uh, every year because Qatar Summer School is every year. So uh, thank you, Regina, for the nice presentation. Yeah, yeah. No, and I thought I really have to mention the Qatar School and because we did really adopt the same, like with lectures and exercises, excursion, it's really the same format because it is so great what Hans Romans has started. And we just put it to a new setting and have a, yeah, a North American focus. Any other questions for Regina? So 
So, uh, Regina, how how can we like as PIs to these various agencies um, beyond you know recommending or, or academics recommending to our students to attend? How, how can we help support summer schools like this? Uh, just mention it to our program managers. Uh, yes. How do, how, do, how do we help you without actually providing money? Yes. I think. Um, I think this is really has been crucial, like when we did the very first one, and now we come like every year again, it is the feedback that like, um, I mean, Tom Wagner was very supportive of the school. And, um, and also basically because then both instructors and students told him that this is very, very useful. And this happened the same with the international organizations. I mean, they gave a few thousand dollars, but then they hear like what an impact that had on the students. And what we of course also do during the summer school, we really advertise and um, promote also these organizations. Um, so there's a little bit of a mutual benefit. I think that's the main thing one can do, really tell the organizations not to stop it. We have to start from scratch every year, every time to get for funding. There's nobody who's gonna give it for, for many years, but it has been like with NASA, it was like, yeah, okay, yeah, we do it, sure. Um, you need to write a, um, and a proposal, but it's gonna be funded. And the same with the international organizations. It's, it's almost like they, they have accepted, okay, they do it, it's great, and we wanna um, fund it. So I think this personal feedback from instructors and students definitely helps. Okay, great. Yeah, definitely agreed. Um, any other questions or comments for Regina? Any any past attendees uh, who want to say a word or two? None presently in the audience. No, I win. I think there are more than just me here. Um, this is Liz at MIT. Um, hi, Regina, great presentation. Um, it's bizarre to see photos of myself as well in this presentation. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, taking up the mantle of the past attendees, um, really excellent experience. It was my first time setting foot on a glacier, which was really important and educational for me. Um, and as Regina said, it's created a lot of connections that I still have to this day and made me feel really good about being part of the glaciological community. So I really appreciate what uh, Regina has done with that summer school and uh, the basis that the Card House Summer School provided as well. Thanks. And this is a nice example. She's part of my proposal that I just submitted in, yeah, in summer for Oslo. And that would never have happened without getting to know her at the summer school. Excellent. Well, well, thank you so much, Regina. That was great. That really was. Um, the, all right. So uh, we will now switch over to Seth Campbell. Uh, and uh, let's see if we can, if you could stop sharing your screen, Regina. Uh, I try. Yeah. What happened? Okay. There we go. Okay, there yep. we go. All, all right. Take it away, okay. Seth. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And All right. Um, so I feel like I don't have to say much after uh, Regina's talk because pretty much half of her points were the same points that I have, which makes this easy. Um, but uh, for reference, uh, Gene Weissfield Research Program is another program in Alaska. Um, I've been affiliated with it. Uh, I was a student in 2007, uh, kind of a non-traditional student. And uh, since that time, I've stayed involved as a, as a geophysics faculty member. And eventually, uh, in 2018, I accepted the position to direct the program. And I think I, I know a lot of folks here uh, on this call. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces that are fairly aware of JERP. Um, some of you I don't know. So hopefully, this is helpful for those of you that, that are not familiar with the program. Um, there are a few other people on the call that I know have participated in JERP. And in fact, Shad O'Neill, I see, is, is on the call as well. Uh, but in this talk, I feel like I'm representing about 100 people, actually, because it's the program has returning people year after year after year. And, and one thing I'd like to point out, too, is I, I think I've probably learned more about our field and, and what really makes an impact from uh, our students more so than our, than our faculty and collaborators. So, I, you know, my contributors on this, I honestly, are a lot of JERP students that we've had over the years. So I think JERP has had 
upwards of 2,500 uh, participants now since 1946, since it, it originally started. Um, uh, so it has a long history um, and it obviously has a long science history as well. Um, and it, I think the, the last point that I, I'll, I'll make on this slide before I jump into the talk is that nowadays students aren't necessarily, you know, I think students are not necessarily keen on uh, learning a discipline. They're, they're keen on coming up with solutions um, and, and, and dealing with issues that we're dealing with environmentally, trying to make a difference on the planet. And, and I think JERP, our, our role has kind of fallen into this, this perspective of basically trying to make leaders that will pursue a, a difference. Um, so this talk is kind of centered around that concept of, of how we, we build leaders in the science community, particularly the polar geosciences community um, and, and what JERP is doing in that regard. And I'm glad Chad's here because I, I, I use this slide frequently from, from his paper they published in Biogeosciences. Um, I think Kristen Tim made this really nice uh, uh, summary figure that, that really gets at the heart of what we're trying to do on JERP is we're really looking at an earth system science perspective. Um, and this is really the only slide that I'll talk about the science of what we're doing because uh, the rest of what I'm gonna talk about is really the how we run the program, uh, current initiatives we have, future initiatives. Um, but I want everyone to kind of keep this concept in mind and, and the main point is that we as geoscientists are already at a disadvantage. I went to a meeting with the main education association uh, last year um, with, with their board of directors and, and they made a point to say that you know, the vast majority of, of science education in high school and, and primary school is, is, is compartmentalized, you know, physics or, or chemistry or biology, but it's very rare that every high school puts all that together in a cohesive format. And it's really even more rare that students actually take those classes. Usually those classes are, are not required courses. So we're kind of set up at, at a disadvantage in some ways, trying to introduce students to the geosciences and the multi-systems earth science concept that most of us work in nowadays. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that as I move forward. So, so JERP's mission now, we actually just changed the mission as of uh, uh, this week. <laughs> um, our new mission is we teach, train, and inspire the scientific leaders of tomorrow. It's really, we're not doing anything different than what we've been doing for the past several decades. Um, but I, I made this figure to try to summarize what JERP is, and it really works as a result of a ton of effort from dozens of individuals and institutions around the country, and really internationally even. So uh, JERP is operated by a nonprofit called the Foundation for Glacial Environmental Research, which has a board of directors, SHAD's on the, on the board of directors, as well as, as others that I'll mention during the presentation. Um, over the years, JERP has gained federal funding from DOD, NASA, NSF. Um, most recently, it sounds like we're, we're setting up a pretty strong program with the Department of Education, which I'll explain shortly. Um, we also have had nonprofit support in the past, um, other nonprofit support in the past. Most recently, we're actually partnering up with American Alpine Club to try to spread our message a little bit more and, and work on our science advocacy, but also they're keen to help us uh, kind of improve opportunities, provide resources for, for students that otherwise wouldn't have a chance to get to the ice field. So, so that's kind of an exciting new development for us. Um, we, we have academic institutions basically providing faculty from around the country and, and, and around the real world, really. And, and the next slide that I show will kind of demonstrate that it's really a phenomenal group effort to make this program run. Um, and we, we have students coming in that are high school students, uh, undergraduate students and graduate students. Uh, so it's quite a range of students. And, and we also, unlike the, the, the program that, that Regina just talked about, we, we have students that range from heavy STEM experience to almost no STEM. We have students that come up to the Icefield program that are interested in science communication and art um, and trying to use art and science communication to explain what, what we as scientists see. And, and that's a big part of what we look for in our students. We're looking for students that have a wide range of experiences that, they can, that are willing to kind of get involved and work with other students that are interested in science. And, and we have educators that are coming up and we have other professional science, science communicators coming to the ice field and artists coming to the ice field. So it's a unique opportunity for all these people to get together, much like real life. Um, and our goal is to really train the next generation of leaders in their own communities. So we hope that our students go back to their own communities and actually make a difference there. Uh, because I think that's one of the things we're lacking in, in our science strategy in the US anyway, and, and really globally. You know, a lot of the environmental problems we're facing don't really know political boundaries, but it's very rare that people step outside their comfort zone and, and, and try to 
make a difference in their own community, but also realize they have to try to start working outside of their communities as well. So that's kind of what part of what JERP is focused on. And then I can't, I'd be remiss to, to not include, we, we do rely on a fair amount of private funding and, and private donations to support JERP. So I, you know, I, I struggle with this slide. I, I love this slide. I think it's probably the most important slide on the talk, um, but I always struggle to put it in on a, in a science community because I, you know, I know I've got, I get pushback occasionally, but I, uh, on this comment, I, I think we could do a much better job as a science community to co uh, co cooperate with each other. Um, I think we do it in generally, but I think this is at the institutional level. I think it's very rare to find institutions that, that don't want to have the, you know, have their name as a first name on a paper, or have their name as a first name on a, on an organization that's making a difference. That's just the way business is. Um, I think the unique thing about JERP is that we're basically bringing resources and faculty from dozens of institutions around the world that actually want a better, more inclusive uh, program, a, a program that's based on cooperation and not really competition. Um, so these two phrases kind of exemplify that to me, you know, one that's more uh, open and one that's more kind of comical. Um, and, you know, these are some pictures of some students and, and faculty working together on the ice field. And that's really exemplifies what JERP is doing. We're really trying to get people to work together, bringing different resources and, and uh, communities together. So in general, the way the program operates, we, we run a, a, a field program from June through early August. It's about two months long, uh, where we bring about 35 students to the ice field every year. Um, and this is, and I'm explaining how it operates currently. The students arrive in Juneau. They get about a week of field safety training uh, in Juneau. Some of our students have never seen snow, uh, much like Regina mentioned. Um, yeah, those students end up doing a two month traverse across the Juneau ice field, about 100 kilometers, give or take. Uh, along the traverse, they continue to gain field safety training. And then we have about 50 faculty that cycle through the program from different institutions that teach different components of our academic curriculum, as well as conduct legitimate science research on the ice field. Um, we also, as part of the faculty, we kind of have junior faculty that, that are actually graduate students working on their graduate research on the ice field. I think last year we had six graduate students from various universities working on their PhD research uh, or master's research on the ice field. Um, we have about 11 camps across the ice field with a, a, a range of equipment. Um, and we really try to provide students a coupled experience. So what that means is they have teaching faculty teaching a specific academic curriculum that we design. And then we have the research faculty coming in doing research and the teaching faculty basically try to integrate that research into the student's experience. So imagine having your first internship experience where you do one, you know, you have one internship you're on one topic. JERP basically provides students to have an opportunity to do six, eight, 10 topics um, through the course of the summer. So it's kind of like a mass blast of earth system science that students get introduced to. And the beauty of it is they have two months to get to know dozens of faculty and staff from around the country. And I think this speaks to Regina's comment very strongly um, about the, that idea of building lifelong mentors and lifelong relationships with the people on the ice field. You really get to know people on JERP. And, and I can tell you, for example, I have two colleagues that I work very closely with uh, on JERP that were my student year on JERP that are still coming back to JERP every year. One is Alan Pope, who just took a position at NSF, and the other is Brad Markle, who just took a position at, uh, at uh, University of Colorado. Um, so it really does build uh, long-term relationships. Um, we also get uh, well over 100 applicants per year. I think last year we had about 120. We had enough, enough good, really solid applicants that had the entire skill set we were looking for to actually run two full programs up to 65 or 70 students last year. But unfortunately, we only have the resources to one, run one program right now. Um, it would, would have just been too much to bite off uh, to run, run two programs. Um, those students that apply come from around the world. Uh, the majority of them are in the United States, but we, we have applicants from basically every, uh, every continent, but Antarctica, obviously. Um, our, our volunteer hours is something that's pretty pretty amazing to me. Uh, we get about 40,000 hours of volunteer time per year from our polar geoscience community, which is pretty unbelievable. I worked this up a couple of days ago and I'm estimating that that's about a one to one, $1.8 million of salary that people are just volunteering their time to come run this program. So to me, to see that type of a input from our community tells me immediately that our science community is keen on these types of programs. If it was me, and I was the person with the fingers on the on the budgets, I'd have 10 of Regina's programs. I'd have 10 JERPs. I'd have 10 
20 uh, uh, inspiring girls programs. I mean, these types of programs really do make an impact. Um, the the operating budget last year was about $380,000 to run the program. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about how that operating budget works, but that's a fair amount of money to get to get 35 students across the ice field. But that also incorporates a bunch of the research that we have going on in the ice field. And, and the last point I make on this slide is that uh, I'm kind of equivalating uh, this program to many U.S. Antarctic program, the way we work right now. Um, we have science teams coming in doing research on the ice field now. Uh, this has been uh, starting to ramp up more and more over the last couple of years. It's been very successful. I'll show some, some examples of, of students working with, with different research teams coming to the ice field. And the reality is we also have capacity to operate May through October. And, and our guess right now is we'd probably be about a 10 to 1 cost savings working here versus other places like Antarctica or Greenland. Um, so I think there's there's hopefully renewed interest in using the ice field for various science and engineering applications. Um, this is an example of one of the field camps. Uh, this, this is Camp 10, the biggest camp. We can house about 70, 75 people at this camp alone. Um, and a few things that I forgot to mention on the last slide, our, our students, they gain the experience on the ice field, but they also really uh, gain some, some, they gain the, the field experience on the ice field, but they also have opportunities outside the ice field as well. Um, and, and a lot of the research is done on the ice field. Students spend time presenting that research after the fact. Um, uh, but I just figured I should show an example for those of you that haven't seen some of the resources we have. This is one of the camps and right where it says Taku Glacier, the ice is about 1500 meters thick. Um, so it's actually the one of the, the thickest temperate glaciers on the planet. Um, so quite a phenomenal location to do some research. This is our academic council. I mentioned dozens of people uh, put effort into uh, JERP every year. This, this group right here, um, I don't have time to go through everyone, but this group particularly works really hard to put our academic curriculum together every single year. Uh, their goal is to try to integrate new data, new results, new strategies, new pedagogical efforts into the JERC curriculum every year. Um, so this is kind of a running uh, curriculum that we work with right now. It's focused on glaciology, but really the, the big key point is it's glaciology in context to other Earth systems. Um, and we certainly have students work, working with a range of field methodologies that you see listed here. And, and in this slide, I have two things that are specifically highlighted in the bottom that, that I think have been probably the most successful of JERP in recent years. One is science communication skills and the other one is sustainability. And again, this hits at that point that, that our, our students want to make a difference when they leave JERP. And we feel like that's very important. Um, because we have such a wide range of students. So I'm going to show some examples of some things that our students have been doing uh, just from a science communication perspective next. So I mentioned we have artists come to the ice field to, to basically, uh, artists and science communicators, professional communicators come to the ice field to work with our students on, on improving their ability to, to communicate science across the, the general population. Um, one of those things that happens quite frequently is, is sketching and designing examples that, that can be kind of absorbed by someone that doesn't have a strong scientific background. So this is an example. Jeremy Stock is a master's student working with Kristen Poinar at Buffalo. Uh, Kristen and Jeremy came up. Jeremy was a full student of the program. Kristen came up to do some research on the ice field. Um, but Jeremy was basically trying to depict the type of work that we were doing on the ice field and how uh, radar works, how an ice core works, what the, sub the snow and fern and ice structure looks like, um, what the meteorological station system, uh, system setup looks like. Um, and then you see a radar data set to the right hand side that students collected where we found a multi-year uh, and glacial aquifer uh, that we mapped out um, that we've had multiple studies focused on this site. There's another, I'm gonna flip through these really quickly. This is another example from Maddie Hall trying to explain glacier mass balance. Um, our students provide presentations in Atlin, British Columbia. It's probably one of the biggest things that happens in Atlin. They get really excited. Most of the town comes to the community event every year. Um, we love working with the Atlin community. What an amazing group of people there. Um, and then our students come back to Juneau at the end of the summer, and we also spend time at the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center and the way we have it set up now. Students basically have tables set up and community members walk around and just meet with students to discuss the science that they're working on in, in the science communication method. And, and these are the types of examples that the students sketch to, to kind of explain what's going on in the glaciers. Uh, here's another one looking at ecological succession that I thought was pretty phenomenal by a, a student, Abby, Abby Case. And the last one I'll show is, is one from Yue Chi, uh, who was a student last year, trying to explain uh, glacier retreat and using cosmogenic nuclei dating 
to to map glacier retreat in terms of the temporal process that's occurring. Um, so for those of you that are, are not familiar with this process, you basically have cosmic rays bombarding the bedrock, uh, impacting it, uh, impacting the quartz and generating brilliant tan. The longer it's exposed, the more brilliant tan builds up. So that was Yui's way to kind of explain that. So that's some examples from our students. You know, what are some other people saying about the program? And, and I, I put a couple examples here. You know, these two people might be biased in some way, but I'm going to rely on Ben Santer's comments. For those of you that don't know Ben Santer, he was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab for many years. He was the lead author for the 1995 IPCC uh, Chapter 8, talking about gl uh, global warming. Um, MacArthur Fellow, National Academy of Sciences. And, and he's been on our board of directors for a number of years, and he speaks very highly of the program and what we're doing there. Um, he really, you know, that point of kind of showing people hands-on what's happening in these environments uh, I think is, is a really strong selling point and trying to have people that we're teaching bring that back to their communities is kind of one of our goals. And then the other thing that I'm going to touch on very quickly is Drew Higgins has, was a prior student and, and she's been really, uh, uh, she wrote this article about uh, basically women reimagining who does science uh, and with the idea that in our past few years, um, I think we have about a 60% uh, male, uh, female to male ratio on the ice field, uh, but that's not enough. We, we have a lot more to do, and I'll talk about that next. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we've, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, we have a long ways to go in the geosciences community to make an impact across lower income, underrepresented students in, in the polar sciences. I think everyone here can probably agree with that. So most recently, we've partnered with uh, a program, TRIO Upward Bound, which is a Department of Education funded program nationwide. Um, we're specifically right now as a trial run working with the main upper bound programs, the Alaska upper bound and a program in New York to offer two new two week programs uh, on the Juno ice field uh, starting in Juneau and primarily being based at our camp that's closest to Juneau. Um, we're working with these programs because they, they specifically work with low income and underrepresented students. They already have a pedagogy and, and a process in place um, to basically help these students along. And these students are high school students. The goal is to help develop opportunities for high school students and long-term mentoring for high school students to basically get them through uh, college and, and, and provide opportunities them, for them beyond college. Um, so we're pretty excited about this because it's likely we're gonna have 70 students next year uh, in addition to our primary 35 student uh, program that we traditionally run. The other thing we're doing next year is we're partnering with a T3 Alliance, which is run by Dr. John Monahan, uh, Dr. Pip Spezi, and, and Adam Lowe, and some others uh, out of UAF, um, basically getting technology into the hands of, of these, these same students. Um, they've been doing this for a number of years, and, and Adam is actually a past JERP uh, alumni, very excited. He's, he's been kind of leading the charge from Alaska's perspective. Um, so we're, we're aiming for that next year. Of course, COVID could have an impact on that. We are pursuing some other funding mechanisms through GeoPass, for example. And, and the reality is we have, a, we have a much bigger capacity to offer up to 10 probably programs uh, two weeks at a time. So maybe up to 300 students per year. Um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking big on that, but we do have that capacity. And I think you know, there, there is certainly interest. Every time we've talked to someone at Upper Bound, they've, they've kind of jumped at this chance. And the beauty is they have funding in hand to actually cover the student travel and expenses to attend these programs, which is amazing. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is not not every student is designed to go into the field. Not every student wants to go to the field. And I think that's an important thing that that we in the geosciences need to have a, do a better job of recognizing. You know, geoscience, you know, a lot of times we always put up that fancy photo, that fancy figure, but it, it's not it's not the selling point for a lot of students. And I think we could do a better job uh, selling geosciences to other students as well. And I think part of that is also we need to do a better job bringing back what we're doing from the field perspective back into the classroom and say, hey, well, we also need people interested in working in the lab and doing numerical modeling and, and all the other aspects that go with geosciences. So that's the other part that we're working on from an education perspective. So I'll finish up with a few slides to kind of showing some of the other stuff that we've been doing. I've mentioned we've really worked hard to partner with research programs, uh, bringing research teams to the ice field and giving students experience. And it's a win-win for both programs. So this is an example of the ice drilling program team coming to Alaska last year to test a thermal drill that they want to use on Mount Waddington. 
Uh, they tested it to 294 meters depth. They basically ran, ran out of cables. The only reason they stopped, they were pretty convinced they could go to probably 500 meters or 600 meters. It was going so smoothly. But our students had an opportunity to work with this team. Phenomenal experience for all involved. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I'll, I'll send you a link to my or shoot me an email. I have some comments from them about, about their experience. Um, Along with this program, not last year, we had Dr. Christine Foreman come to the ice field on a NASA funded project looking at spectral signs and life in the ice. Um, and as part of this opportunity, because we had ice, the ice drilling program there and Christine was interested in ice samples, Christine was able to acquire ice 294 meters in the Juno ice field for her analyses. That would never happen in most places. It's so rare for something like that to happen. And I think the key point that I wanna hammer home here is that we, what we try to do on the ice field is we try to have our science teams get in touch with each other before they come to the ice with the idea of letting each other know what they're actually planning on doing, the resources that they're bringing to the table, and to determine if there's any additional work they might be able to collaborate on and expand upon. I think this is, I think we as a community has to have to do a better job fostering that because we all know money's tight. And I think there's a lot we can do in that capacity uh, to get more science, more bang for our buck in some capacity. And then throw in the concept that we have dozens of students there interested, just waiting to help out and do science. This is an amazing opportunity as far as I'm concerned. So the last example I'll show is we have another opportunity next year, hopefully, to have uh, starting next year. It's it's dependent on whether NASA funds it or not, but we're waiting uh, patiently. Um, there's a team from the National Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, Dr. Samuel Howell, Miles Smith, and Jean Pierre Fleuro, that are designing a a autonomous drill system that they ultimately hope to send in about 15 years time to Europa to drill 30 kilometers of ice to collect a water sample. It would also have a serious payload underneath that. So. We've pitched to NASA to actually test the system on the Juno ice field, um, initially at 200 meters depth and then potentially at much greater depths. Uh, the concept being that a thousand meters on Earth is equivalent to about 10, 10 kilometers on, on Europa. Um, and, and my pitch here is that we have a pretty amazing opportunity to kind of use this and leverage this for Earth system science perspective as well. Can you imagine having a, a 1500 meter hole through Taco Glacier that reaches the bed on one of the, the deepest temperate glaciers on, on the planet uh, to use for earth systems, you know, glaciological studies? What's at the bed? You know, what other things can we do from a deformation perspective? What about glacial uh, geobiology perspectives? Um, so the idea is to try to put earth and planetary sciences working together on these types of applications. And that shifts me to that concept that we're trying to push pretty hard for right now. Uh, a group of us put together a, a NASA white paper uh, la this past year to basically try to develop uh, the ice field into a kind of a polar extreme uh, environment site for Earth and planetary science missions. The concept being that we're already doing Earth and planetary science research there. We already are doing sensor and scientific equipment R&D. We already have a well-established education program. We already know more about that site than just about any glacier system on the planet. Uh, or very, very few or <laughs> have know more about it. There's a lot of other work we can do. Right now, authors on that that white paper come from Maine, New Hampshire, Montana, Washington, and Colorado. We have other author, other folks that are interested from New York, California, and, and Alaska. Um, so that's something that we're pushing pretty hard to, to try to bolster uh, future funding to support this type of avenue. So with that, I, I'll, I'll finish you know, my summary. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to my mission statement. I think it's really important. We, you know, I would love to see many, many more programs like, like the program Regina just talked about, like Aaron Pettit's uh, you know, Inspiring Girls that's, that's starting to go global here um, and, and many more jerks. But we have what we have right now and, and, and I'm pretty convinced that, that we have some pretty cool opportunities to use places like the Junior Rice Field for multi-institution collaborative research. Um, and uh, you know, not just research, but that education perspective, you know, we, we can kind of partner these things up. Um, and the, the last slide, I'm just gonna leave some discussion questions because it was suggested. Um, and you know, the likelihood in the future, right now I run this out of UMaine primarily because that's my affiliation, but I honestly, I, I think JERP is well suited moving forward to become more of a consortium. Um, and, and I and I think that's the wave of the future. And I think there's a lot of opportunities to kind of leverage all of our mutual resources to turn it more into a consortium. So that, those are the types of questions I'd like to discuss uh, amongst people here. If anyone has questions or wants more information, by all means, reach out to me. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Seth. That is a, a very, I, I, I did not realize quite the full scope of JERP, and you've definitely given us a great overview of that. Really appreciate it. Um, if you want to go back to your discussion questions, though, I think that keeping sure. those up is probably a great way to Absolutely. keep us moving. Because Regina can't stay much longer, I want to first offer, offer her the floor to see if she has any questions. Um, well, let me think about that. <laughs> it, was a, okay. it was a great presentation, great overview. And even, I mean, having lived in Fairbanks, I didn't have sort of the full, was not aware of this full scope of Europe. So that was really interesting. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I was pretty intrigued by the upper bound, uh, the DOE connection. That, that seemed like an excellent way of bringing underrepresented uh, groups uh, more into earth science and glaciology. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, so we approached Maine initially and uh, the director for UMaine, there's five sites in Maine, they service about 500 students from, from so, you know, that they're challenged socioeconomically uh, diver or the majority of upper bound students are either uh, uh, low income or they come from households where uh, neither parent has a college education. Um, uh, and that, that hits a range of students depending on what state you're in. You know, Maine is predominantly white. Alaska's program, it sounds like a lot of their students are native Alaskan. Um, you know, Colorado, New York, the other schools that we're looking at working with have, have a much wider racial diversity. So it, it really depends on where you're at. But the beauty of this program is they have a couple thousand dollars available per student to, to send the student to cover the student's expenses to get to the ice field. Um, so, you know, the things we're looking for are funding to support equipment to cover students because a lot of these students don't have the necessary yeah. field equipment. Um, to, to just cover the travel and expenses for the faculty that are volunteering their time. And ideally we have a few faculty who are just funded to be there to run this program. Uh, the upper bound faculty are also funded. So, you know, they, they, you know we, we benefit from that. So it's, it's a transition from the, you know, asking NSF, asking NASA to fund us solely these types of programs. And, and I think, you know, when you look at our budget, right, you know, what DOD gets like $680 billion a year. I think that was our last year's budget. Department of Education is like 68 billion. And you know, NASA is like 20 billion and NSF is like 8 billion, right? So when you look at the possibility for us to leverage NASA, NSF funding to help co-fund something like that, those are the types of things that you know, I think of when I'm like, when, you, know, you asked Regina that question earlier, how can, how can the people on this call help? Um, you know, I think those are the types of questions that, that need to be addressed and need to be brought up to our program managers and the people that have the bucks in hand. You know, I still classify myself as an early career scientist, right? You know, I'm, I'm doing what I can with this program. I got to be honest, any negative comment that I've ever received about JERP has primarily been from a senior scientist. Um, and it's, it's a demoralizing situation for me to have to say that, but I'm, I'm being honest. Um, it has not been from the new generation of scientists that, that want to go to these places, want to work together. Um, and I think that should stand for something. Um, and, and, you know, my hope is that these types of presentations that we talk about, Jared, my hope is that actually gets the word out a little more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Joel, I do have a question. If Go for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned the many volunteer hours that go in, but still the cost of the program for the individual student is, I mean, enormous. So how do you want to address that? Or what kinds of plans do you have for the future? Because I think it's like thousands and thousands of dollars to participate in the program. And that, of course, doesn't make it very easily available for like a broader, yeah, broader range of students with different backgrounds. The, I completely agree with you, Regina. Uh, that's where this upper bound thing comes into play. You know, these 70 students, we're basically effectively doubling the number of students, well, tripling the number of students that we're going to have participating in a JERP program, but those students aren't paying a penny. That's, that's the beauty of it, you know, just by having upper bound involved in that process. You know, we, we, you know, I completely agree with you. And, you know, it hits on all the same topics here. We're doing the same exact thing. We're putting students in a remote environment for two months. They're away from phones, they're away from technology. They develop these lifelong relationships, um, you know, and our goal is to send those students back, but that does cost money. And, and I agree with you. My point being the students shouldn't be paying for that. I agree with you as well. This is what NASA and NSF and DOE and other programs should be paying for. 
you know, that, that, because I, you know, we know, look, look at the community, look at our broader community in the, in the U S there's many, many people have gone through jerk. Many people have gone through your glaciology program. Many people have gone through these experiences that have stayed within it. It's a matter of finding funding. And I'm, I'm less inclined to say, well, it's too expensive. I'm more inclined to say, let's find the money to make it happen because we know it's effective and that we know it is successful. Good points. Uh, any, anyone else with any question? Um, yeah, says uh, I think this is Hongjie get uh, topic. Uh, uh, this is really inspiring because, as you know, Texas, our student uh, in the middle school, high school, they don't have earth science uh, classes, so they already make a decision, make a mind what do they want to do uh, uh, when they get uh, before they get to college. So this is really a lack, uh, and uh, uh, we are. We are like, uh, San Antonio is like uh, 65 or 70 percent of uh, Hispanic uh, population. So we really would like actually uh, collaborate with you guys on this uh, upbound program with, uh, from the Department of Education. So we can uh, support some students to go to this kind of field in high school, middle school. They can get to expose to the earth science, glaciology, or whatever. And uh, also talk about uh, the planetary science and uh, uh, extreme environment. This is really cool. Uh, this is actually what we are doing. Uh, our NASA funded project, uh, we talk about the extreme environment, uh, the, the, the polar region, the ocean, the, the air, and then the, the planetary, the uh, deep space. So uh, I think we should talk. <laughs> I, you know, my email's there. Please do shoot me an email. I will yeah. say, you know, this this upper bound link, you know, yeah. we we just reached out to him and, and literally every response has been, this is amazing. You know, these are the types of things we want to give our students. Yes. Uh, I've had them, you know, come back and say, we didn't actually know what to spend our money on this last year, you know. So, That's great. you know, this is, you know, it, it's an opportunity to really put some students in the field and, and kind of yeah. bolster our our you know, underrepresented community in the polar geosciences. So I'd yeah. love to talk to you. Shoot me an email, please. Thank you. I will. Seth, with respect to sort of other opportunities that might lie out there to, to expand the scope of JERP or, or keep it going for a longer time, can you talk a little more about what you're thinking with respect to the LTER? Uh, yeah. Is that something you've explored in detail? So, you know, I've talked with different program managers about these. Um, I, I just put, you know, so we, we had submitted an EPCOR to NASA last year. It had really, really good reviews, which declined. Um, uh, you know, so we're, we're kind of in the hemming and hawing about whether we resubmit because it was from primarily, it sounded like it was declined at the, the program management level. Um, we were on a critical zone observatory proposal that was being put together, but that ended up getting canceled. Um, you know, so we, we've been looking at those types of opportunities. I put up the LTER, but I talked to, uh, I think it was, I'm trying to remember who the program, uh, Lisa Clow, I think a while, a few years ago. And, and I think they, you know, they weren't planning on doing a LTER. I think she's in oceanography now, but, you know, basically I just put a list up there very quickly of those are the types of things that I think JERP could be beneficial to another program. I will say we are, we're going on a coastlines and people's proposal with uh, Anna Lilladal. She's leading it. Um, right now with many, many people um, on this proposal and, and we're going on it in part for some of the main stuff that we do, myself and Kristen Schild and, and uh, Sam Roy, uh, but also JERP is on that proposal as kind of an education outreach component to support these upper bound programs. Um, you know, primarily the concept of we're, we're working with the Alaska communities. Um, so, you know, I throw those out there because I, I'm looking for, for, for my concept, trying to build you know, multi-year, as Regina brought up, building out multi-year programs that, that might have sustained support because this is supposed to be a month job for me per year. And you can ask Shad how much time I put into this. This is not yeah. a month. And Maine has been extremely flexible with me, very supportive uh, of this, but it's been, it's been a lot of work to try to pull this off. Yeah, I know, completely understand. The less you have to hustle for money, the more you can educate students. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions for uh, Seth? Well, hey, all right, so we're, we're just past the top of the hour, and uh, I just want to say thanks again to Regina and Seth. Those were great presentations. I learned a lot, uh, having unfortunately not had the chance to participate these back when I was uh, younger, And uh, but I'm glad to hear many have, and many more are still to this day, and there are 
good possibilities for the future with a diverse set of programs. So, uh, so yeah, thanks again, Seth and Regina. And uh, yeah, that'll conclude today's meeting. We're going to have uh, our next meeting is going to be uh, a, a co-meeting with the modeling sub team, I believe, in November. Uh, and I believe the topic is going to be uh, ISMIP 6, the ice sheet uh, model into comparison 6 using the CMIP 5 ensembles. Uh, 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 Meredith, is that correct? I think I'm, I think I'm right. I can't recall the exact date. Yeah, um, I don't know the exact date either, but it should be at the regular time. So the um, yeah. first Thursday at um, 3 Eastern. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, one Eastern. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's at least what we're intending to do. And, uh, yeah, but uh, thank you again for everyone for participating. Much appreciated. I uh, hope you learned something. I certainly did. And uh, we will see you again next time. And uh, be safe. Thank you all. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Yeah, see you, thank, you. thank you. Bye.